I'll be reading this morning from Luke chapter 12. Then someone called from the crowd, Teacher, please tell me, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Jesus replied, Friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? Then he said, Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops, and he said to himself, What should I do? I don't have room for my crops. Then he said, I know. I'll tear them down. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, My friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Take, now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth but not have a rich relationship with God. Psalm 1. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the river bank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves neither wither, and they prosper in all they do. Amen. Thank you, Lydia. We are going to be, as a church, memorizing Psalm 1 over the next four weeks. I'm going to invite you to choose whatever... Uh, translation or paraphrase you want. We just read from the NLT there. I'll probably be memorizing it from the English Standard Version. You might want to use the NIV or the New American Standard or whatever you have. But I want to encourage you, go ahead and, uh, I'll, I'll be talking more about it uh, next week, but go ahead and get a head start. Choose whatever, whatever version of the Bible you normally read and begin memorizing Psalm chapter 1. We're going to do, do that together over the next four weeks. Maybe I'll have a couple of you come up here and, 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 and recite it. Uh, I won't surprise you. I'll tell you ahead of time, but maybe I'll have you do that. Welcome to River Church. We're starting a new series. Uh, I have not really preached a series on generosity. Uh, the big church word is stewardship. I've not preached a sermon series um, on this topic really for seven years. Um, we talked about it some. Uh, and we've talked about it individually and in smaller groups, but this is the first time that I really have preached this topic um, in, in such a detailed way as I plan to over the next four weeks. What we're looking at is how God is extravagantly generous. How our God is a, an extravagantly generous God and how our generosity, my generosity toward you and, and your generosity toward one another and, and, and how we are a generous people, um, how that mirrors or reflects our God. Isn't it always that way in a home? When you have a generous parent, I've noticed this having worked in the church all of my adult life, when you have a generous parent, over the course of time, that generous parent or those generous parents, they tend to raise generous children. You may not see it in the early days, but generally speaking, those kids, they, they turn out to be generous adults. Maybe that's true in your own life. Maybe you were raised by a generous parent and, and perhaps you are a generous person yourself. Perhaps you were raised by a parent who wasn't generous at all. Uh, stingy and fearful, and, and maybe that's a struggle you have. Maybe you struggle with, with fear regarding money. Maybe you struggle with being stingy. Everyone in this room, I'm just going to go ahead and say this. I believe this to be the case. Everyone in this room, without, without exception, wants to be known as a generous person. 
I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say there's probably no one here who wants to have the reputation of being stingy or miserly or keeping all everything for himself or herself. I think everyone in this room, you, you'd like to think that other people would view you as a generous person. But sometimes we're not, right? Sometimes there's this, this, this tension, this dichotomy. Isn't it always uh, weird and thought-provoking when you, when you say, like, there's something I really want to be, but I'm not. Like, I, I really want to be like that, but for some reason I always fall short. I, I stop short. I, I struggle with that. And so perhaps you've wondered, I, I've wondered this regarding different topics, including generosity, why do I struggle with it? And the main reason, when you, when you pick any, any, any topic, any trait in your life, when you, when you say like, I want to be that, but, but I'm just, I'm not, I'm not making it. Like I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm holding myself back. Why am I not becoming who I want to be? Almost always the issue in your life is fear. And when it comes to generosity, the reason that we aren't generous when we're not generous, and, and the reason we struggle with it is a deep-seated fear that God is not really that generous. And so like I said, a parent, a parent is generous, and then kids, they, they mirror that. Kids, they, they imitate that. And so, so for some of us, for some of us, perhaps there's this, this fear, like, I don't know that God really is that generous. Like, I want to believe it. I know Scripture says it. Uh, I'm not trying to be mean or ugly toward God. I just, I struggle with, with the, whether or not God really is generous. Sometimes I, I fear that maybe he doesn't really work on my behalf, have my best interest at heart. It seems like he's working on everyone else's behalf. It seems like he has other people's interest at heart, but maybe he doesn't have my interest at heart. And therefore, if I give it away, I might run out myself. But you see, what I want to convince you of over the next four weeks is that, that if, you, if you test God, you, you will see, you will find out that he truly is a generous God. He is, in fact, extravagantly generous. In fact, that is one of the tenets of our faith. Like the Old Testament, the New Testament, what we believe as Christians, as Christ followers, we are compelled to believe, if we're going to follow Christ, that God is, in fact, who he says he is in the Bible, a generous God, an extravagantly generous God. And there are stories, many stories, in this Bible, and there are stories, many stories, in this room of how God has been extravagantly generous, worked on our behalf time and time again. So, so as I said, God is, is generous like parents are generous. God is generous toward his children like parents are generous toward his children. We have, we have parents in here, and you know that you're generous to your children in ways that they don't even realize, but, but guess what? One day they will, and they'll thank you. And you have, we are kids in this room, and, and, and I'm just going to tell you, your parents are generous toward you, and you don't realize it yet fully, but one day you will, and then one day you will be a parent, and you will be generous like your parents are generous toward you. And it's like that with God. There are ways in which we don't fully understand, we don't fully realize, like a kid who, he knows, like, I've got it good, but, but I don't quite yet have it in mind, completely comprehend how good my parents have been, how generous my parents are toward me. And, and we're like that with God. And God understands. God, God knows that we're still like kids and we're growing up and we're learning to trust him and we're learning to be like him. And that's what we're going to be talking about over the next four weeks. I'll give you a silly little example. Um, kids children in the room right now, and, and maybe you can remember this, you adults remember when you were a kid and it was like this. You know how your mom and dad um, yell at you to come to the dinner table at night? <laughs> and it's like super annoying, like, like, come on, it's time to go. fix your plates, sit down, it's time to eat, you know, all that mess. <clears throat> Do you know what's really, really motivating your parents in that? It's their generosity. Here's what I mean by that. Parents, you, you, can, you can attest to this. They want you 
to come to the table because they want to make sure that there's enough food for you. And they want to make sure that you get served before they serve themselves. And mom and dad are really hungry, so get yourself to the table and make your plate because then we're going to make our plates, but we want to make sure that you have enough food to eat. You see what's going on there? There's this heart of generosity that's often and even lost uh, in the perspective of the child toward the parent. In other words, your parents, they would go without. Or your parents, they would dig in the refrigerator and eat leftovers in order for you to go first, in order for you to have what you need and in fact what you want because mom and dad are generous like that. Here's the truth. God is like that. Now, now God doesn't sit down literally at a table and wait for us to, to, to eat before he eats, but God is extra, extravagantly generous in that way. What we know from the story of the gospel, what we know from the story of, of Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection is that, that, that God was, was, was more than willing to to lay low, to inconvenience himself, to humble himself, to, to, to come to this earth and get dirty and die for our sakes. He was willing to bear the load, to bear the burden for our benefit. That is the extravagantly generous God that I speak of. Generosity, the textbook definition would, would be this. Showing a readiness to give more of something that is strictly necessary or required. So generosity is giving more than you have to. Giving more than is required of you. So I said this a month or two ago. When you, when you pay your PUB bill every month, that is, that's not generosity. That is required of you. But, but if, you were, if you were to pay someone else's PUB bill, that would be generosity. Because that's not required of you. It's not strictly necessary. Generosity. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll go so far as to say when you go to a restaurant and you uh, have a $20 bill and you leave uh, th uh, $3. I'm going to say that's not really in our society, in our culture, generosity. That's almost required. I suppose it's not absolutely required, but that's a 15% tip. But when you go to a restaurant and you have a $20 bill and you leave $10 or you leave $20, that would be generous. It's not strictly uh, necessary. It's not required, you're, you, you're, you're voluntarily giving. As I said, everyone wants to be known as generous, but very few of us want to go without. It's kind of like, it's, this, is, this is chasing a rabbit briefly here, but it's kind of like how everyone wants to be known as humble, but no one wants to be wrong, right? Everyone wants to be known as generous, but, but going without, that's difficult. Now I say all that in preface, what I really want to, 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 to elevate or, 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 or shed light on today is, is what a generous lot of people you are here at River Church. In 2019, what a generous group of people you have been. You have given extravagantly. Um, many of you have, have, have done without in, in small ways in order to be generous toward River Church. Uh, some of you have, have done without in really big ways in order to give to the work of the church here at River Church in the past year. I know that and the elders know that and I want you to know that that your generosity doesn't go unnoticed. Sometimes I fear that in the church, that we just, we just knock off another year and click off another year and, 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 and generosity doesn't get noticed. It doesn't, there, there, there's no thank you involved in it. And, 
we your elders, we, we're, the letter's going out and, 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 and you, you need that for tax purposes, but you also need that so that, that you hear from us a, a, a thank you, uh, a word of, you know, in, in, in some ways, like in, in very real ways, River Church wouldn't be here, not in this iteration, not in this form and fashion, if it wasn't for the generosity of, of good people like you. And so we've been, I've been, I've been praying for you. I've been praying for you by name. And we're praying that God would bless you. And that God would bless River Church. And that God would make us even more generous as a group of people in 2020. So again, thank you. Those of you that are, are generous and have been generous over the long haul, I say thank you. Throughout history... The Lord has always worked. Again, I'll say that. Always worked through the generosity of his children. It's a, it's a, it's a, a weird and interesting aspect of how God shows his generosity. But throughout history, he, is always, he doesn't bypass, uh, go around his children in being generous. Always when he's generous, he's generous through his people. Uh, in other words... God has never just airmailed money to people in, in, in need, to, to, to churches in need. Uh, he has always provided through the generosity of wise money managers like you. We're going to get to that in a minute, but do you know that you're that? You are a money manager? That sounds awfully official. I'll talk about that in a minute. There's a teaching in the Bible. A, 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 an ethic, a teaching a, uh, regarding generosity um, in the community of faith. And it's in the, in the Old Testament. We see this, we see this teaching uh, happening uh, practically in the temple. And then we see it in the synagogues. And then we see it in, in the churches to this day. You know what that teaching is? You know what that, that practical teaching? Ethic is started in the Old Testament. We saw it through the synagogue into the New Testament church. Here's the principle. In the community of faith, we generously share the burdens of life together. We, we carry the load together. In other words, everyone pitches in. Everyone does her part. Everyone does his part. And together, we build the church, together we meet needs. Together we are generous toward those who are in need. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 8 and 9 speak much volumes in only two chapters volumes about, about finances in the church. Um, we'll look at, we'll, we'll be going back to 8 and 9 quite a bit over the next four weeks. Paul says this, of course I don't mean your giving should make life easy for others and hard for yourselves. I only mean that there should be some equality. What he's talking about, he's talking to the church in Corinth, but he's talking about the church in Macedonia. He's talking to the church in Corinth about the church in Macedonia. He's saying, be generous like they're generous. And he uses this word of, of, of this shared sort of burden. In, in Galatians, it's, it's, it's quite similar. It says, share each other's burdens. In fact, you know that to be a Christian ethic. We are to share one another's burdens. We, we, we hear that all the time. Share one another's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Now, the thing about carrying one another's burdens is that I can't carry your burden without it being a burden to myself. We tend to want to carry others' burdens, but we don't want to be burdened in the process. And that's just not possible. The very nature of a burden is if I'm going to share your burden, <clears throat> you're going to share my burden, we're going to share one another's, carry one another's burdens, then I'm going to be put out. I'm going to be burdened myself. There's no way around that. You have to inconvenience yourself. If you're going to become generous like your heavenly father is generous, then there are some, some general principles, some big ideas that, that we need to explore together. And today we're going to look at four of them. 
rather briefly and then we'll, we'll come back to them in weeks to come. But before I go on, there's a question that I think most of us ask internally. So I just want to kind of put it out there. It's kind of the elephant in the room. Let's just acknowledge it. And then we'll go on with our four big ideas. The, the question is this. Maybe you've asked this. If God is so generous, Pastor Randy, if God is so generous, why are some of his children so poor? And perhaps the answer isn't that God isn't generous. But rather his children are not generous toward one another. So we're going to explore that over the next few weeks. All right, let's jump into four big ideas that come out of the, the passages that, that, that Miss Lydia read. First idea is this. We, you and I, we are managers. We're not owners. Now this is only true if you're a Christian. If you are uh, not a Christian, you consider yourself a, uh, a non-Christian you're just making your money on your own time and your own way. I mean, I would, I would, I'm still convinced that God has given you all that you have. But, but if you are not a Christ follower, then you're free to call yourself an owner. Pretend like you own everything. Pretend like you made it with your own, you know, the sweat of your own brow. And it's yours. And you own it. And you can do with it what you want. But a Christian principle, a biblical principle, is that, that, that we are, as Christ followers, we are managers. As a Christian, I am a, a manager of all my resources, and God is the owner. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says this. Just, just listen. It says, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. And that price, you know, is, 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 is the, the Jesus' blood. He, he died on the cross. He paid the price so that now you aren't your own. You aren't a free agent. Now you're a child of God. So think on this. If, if you're not even your own, you don't even own yourself, then it stands to reason that, that your stuff isn't yours. You don't own it. The biblical principle. You are a manager. You're the manager of what God has given you. You're a manager of all the things that God has blessed you with. If you're a Christian, that's a Christian central teaching that we live by. You know the old school word for that? The old school word is steward. If you grew up in, a, in the church like I did, you would often hear the word stewardship. It's just a fancy word for talking about how we handle our money. Stewardship but, but the word steward actually is, is an old school word for manager. Now when I say the word steward, what's the first thing you think of? Maybe you think of, of airplane. Lydia just dropped Alyssa off at the airport this morning when it was still dark and sleepy eyed. She climbed on that plane and she flew all the way back to, to Kansas City. And a little, my, a little bit of my heart went with her. But, but there was somebody on that plane, uh, several of them, called stewards or stewardesses. Maybe they just call them all stewards now. I don't know. But what is that steward doing? On an airline, the steward, it, he or she manages people on behalf of the airline. The steward doesn't own the airplane and the steward doesn't own the people and the student. The steward isn't really the, the, the ultimately the boss of everybody. But, but the steward has been assigned this responsibility of managing, in that case, people. If you're a steward of an estate, maybe there's some rich uncle or aunt, and they have made you uh, the steward of the estate, then what do you do? You're the manager. I mean, he or she owns it, your relative, and, and, and has put you in charge of, of managing it, making good decision on decisions on his behalf or her behalf. I read, I read this week, I was looking at the word steward, I read this week another use of the word that, that farmers, farmers pride themselves on being stewards of the land. God created it. God owns it. We are caretaking this land. They're taking good care of the land 
that God owns and that they are stewarding. And that's us. With everything that we own, the house that I own, the cars that I own, all my stuff, the money I have in the bank, I, I'm a, a manager. But, but God is the owner. I remember when I was, I was 20 years old, 19 or 20 years old. It's like 1989. And my, my parents, my mom and dad, blessed me by buying me an, actually a new pickup truck. And, and it was, it was a, pickup trucks were different back then. They were, it was short and it only had two, you could only, you could only, it was a bench seat for two, three people at the most. It had air conditioning and a radio, but no tape player. It didn't have carpet, it had rubber, rubber floors. Uh, it had a standard stick shift. Uh, and uh, you had to crank the windows down. It was a nice pick, it was a six cylinder, uh, so not a whole lot of power. It was a nice pickup, but, but, but a simple pickup. But I remember as a 19, 20 year old, uh, my dad and I went down there and he, he paid for it. He was a good manager of his money, so he wrote a check for it. And I, uh, we got in it and I was so thankful and I didn't want to make my dad feel bad because it was a beautiful gift for my dad, but I wanted to thank the Lord. And I remember like awkward, like a 19 year old saying, hey dad, can we pray? And I remember, and this is one of my high moments. I had a lot of low moments in my, in my teenage and in, in 20s, uh, teenage years and 20s, but this was a high moment, high watermark. I said, I, wanna, I want to dedicate this truck to the Lord. Like, like I want to use it um, in a way that is honoring to him. What was I doing there? I was just a kid, but I was saying, I want to, I want to be a manager. I want to steward this well, but I want to acknowledge that, that it's, it's God. It's his truck. I just want to manage it well. And, and my gosh, we drove that truck 250,000 miles in I don't know how many years, and the doors would actually fly open when you would take, when you would make sharp turns, and finally we sold it, and I think, <laughs> No joke. I think, we got a, I think we still got a grand out of it when we sold it. It was a good truck. And I really feel like God blessed us through that truck and honored the fact that I was dedicating it to him. The story that we read this morning from Luke 12 is two brothers. Apparently two brothers that are fighting over their inheritance. Their parents uh, must have uh, recently uh, passed away. And so they're fighting. And, and if, you've not, if you've not been through that, I haven't, I haven't been through any inheritance stuff, but, but if you've not been through that, this may be hard to imagine, but, but I know families who have been divided over this very issue. It's sad, but it happens. So in this story, we have two brothers, and, 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 and one brother, it seems he'll be saying, tell my brother to give me my half, to, to, or to give me whatever I deserve. To give me my portion. And, 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 and Jesus, he says, this, this, isn't, this isn't my, uh, my, my, my job here to, to, to teach you how to, how to divide your inheritance. He says, there's a, there's, a bigger, there's a bigger issue here. There's a bigger ethic here. And so then Jesus, uh, he, he unrolls this this, this ethic, this, this teaching, and it's our, our second big idea today, and that is this. According to Christ, life does not exist in the abundance of things. Man, we're just coming off the holidays, and we're just, just coming off of uh, a lot of spending and, and a lot of, you know, purchase, purchasing at the, the stuff mart, and, and, and doesn't it? Doesn't it feel very personal when you, when you hear Jesus say that? Like, remember, life does not exist in the abundance of things. It, it, in, the, in the NLT, it says, Jesus says, life is not measured by how much you own. Another translation, the, the ESV, the English Standard Version, one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. 
And we need to hear that. And we, we need to be reminded of that. that. That's something that probably every one of us in this room, by the very result of the fact that we live in the United States, we probably struggle with. We probably struggle with our identity and our value and our significance being wrapped up in our possessions and, and feeling, feeling better about ourselves according to how much we amass. And Jesus says, stop, whoa. He says this to the brothers who are fighting over, over the inheritance. He says, look, this is what you need to realize. Big idea number two in our study today. Life does not exist in the abundance of things. Paul said it to young Timothy in this way. He said, godliness with contentment is great gain. So Jesus makes this point. Life does not exist in the, in the abundance of things. And then he does what he often does in the New Testament. He teaches this lesson by telling a story. Here's the lesson. The lesson is life does not revolve around the stuff that you accrue, the stuff that you amass. And he says, now let me tell you a little story. And he tells the story of, of a rich farmer, a wealthy, successful farmer. And, and this farmer has what's called a bumper crop. And, 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 and the farmer realized, I don't have barns big enough to store the crops that I have harvested. Not many farmers in the room today. Sometimes we have farmers here, but not any farmers. But, but whatever it is, uh, whatever, whatever stuff you uh, make or produce or, or, or accrue, like you can, you can imagine, like I'm, I have all of this stuff that I've accrued, uh, in his case, um, his crops, and, and, and I, I don't have enough place, uh, enough room to store the crops. And so he says, I'll tear down my older barns, and I'll build newer, bigger barns, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll sit back, uh, and I'll, I'll say to myself, self, you can now eat and drink and be merry. You deserve it. And I can, I can kind of relate to that sort of attitude. Yeah, and, then, and then Jesus goes on with the story and he calls the farmer, sadly, he calls him, he calls him foolish. He says, but, but God said to him on that, on that night, on that night when he had, I, I suppose, finished all of the, the construction and the barns were now built. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night then who will get everything you worked for? And see what Jesus is doing? He's kind of coming back to like, like the, the, the two brothers who are now fighting over all this stuff there. I mean, maybe he's telling a story about their dad. I don't know. Like your foolish sons are now going to get all, all the stuff that you worked hard for and then you build all these barns for. You won't even get to enjoy it, God is saying. And then he goes on and he says, yes, a person... A person is a fool to store up earthly wealth but not have a rich relationship with God. And so I wonder, I wonder in this story, was the problem, was the problem that this man built bigger barns? And I would be quick to say, of course not. No, of course not. The, the, in, fact, in fact, if Jesus were telling this story and, and he, said, he said, you know, the, this farmer, trying to teach a different lesson, this farmer had a bumper crop and he, he, didn't, have, he didn't have barns enough to store the grain so he just, he just threw it out on the ground and then the birds and the rats came and ate it and it was all gone. I believe Jesus would, would, would say with, with equal... Uh, Emotion and fervor, he would say, that too would be a foolish man. The problem wasn't that, 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 uh, that, that he built barns. In fact, that was a wise move. There are all sorts of biblical teachings regarding us building barns to, to store our stuff rather than letting it just be wasted. And, 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 and the problem wasn't in his abundance 
of things. See, the problem isn't abundance. Nowhere in the Bible is it taught that, that it's wrong to be wealthy or it's wrong to have an abundance of things or it's wrong to be a successful farmer such that your crops grow well and you have a bumper crop. There are several Christians in the New Testament who had, who had an abundance of things. In fact, it's a different story on a different day, a different, a different uh, t uh, sermon on a different day, but there were wealthy uh, men and in particular some wealthy women who probably funded Jesus' ministry and funded the ministries of the early church um, in, in, in that early church era, including in uh, the, the Gospels and the book of Acts. I mean, there are people who God blesses richly in the Bible who had an abundance of things. There is nothing wrong with abundance. If, if this farmer had been a wise man, but he wasn't, he was he's foolish, that's what God calls him. By the way, you ever, you ever fall into the trap of thinking that you're wise because of your money? Do you ever fall into the trap of, of looking at someone who has money and saying, oh, like, that, that's, that's wisdom right there. And I would say, according to this story, not necessarily so. Maybe. Maybe not. This, this man had lots of, of money, and that's okay, but, but he was not... He was called a fool. Not all rich people are wise and, and not all poor people are, are foolish. Neither is the opposite true. What makes him foolish in this story is his perspective on money. What he does with his money. Money, money has great power for good in this world. Money has great power for good in this world. Or you can store it in increasingly larger barns, just, just filling bigger barns. Having an abundance of money or goods or crops is not bad. I believe it's actually quite good. So what is the difference, let me ask you, what is the difference between abundance... And greed. And I would tell you that the only difference between the Christian who lives in abundance and the foolish person who lives in greed is generosity. Abundance becomes greed the day you stop giving. So what makes a, 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 great, a, a great manager? It's, it's wise stewardship. He's making good, wise decision. And, and, and to whom does God entrust more resources? I've thought a lot about this, deciding whether or not I wanted to say this, but, but I, I do. To whom does God entrust more resources, increasingly more resources? I believe it's the wise manager. It's the good steward. As I said, we're wrapping up the, the 2019 uh, finances for the church. They they're, they're really pretty much are wrapped up. And, and as I've said, I'm, 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 I'm blown away by your generosity as a people. Your, 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 the fact that many of you are, are good stewards, wise managers. And so I think it's a fair question to ask. To ask do you get anything in return for that? I think that's a fair question. I mean, you're, you're going to soon get a letter uh, in writing and a letter via an email that says, that says this, quote, this letter, that's what the letter says, um, if, you've, if you've given to River Church in the past, you know, it serves for IRS purposes. This letter serves as evidence of your, it will say, 2019 contributions to the church totaling, and then it'll say how much you gave, and it says, this letter also serves as representation that no goods or services were provided to you in exchange for your contributions other than intangible religious benefits, right? So many of you will get that letter. The Caulfields will get that letter for, for what we gave to the church this year. And it says in that letter it ex expressly that, that, that you didn't, we didn't like give you something in return. You didn't give us money and then we like gave you a car in return. Like you gave it. It was, a, it was a gift. So the letter says you don't get anything in return. But I ask you, 
Do you actually get anything in return? The question, does God give more money to those who are wise managers? And I believe the answer is yes. See, we, we, we look at it in a very, very small window of time and question whether or not that's true. But, but I do believe over time, God entrusts his resources to wise managers who are generous. Over time. And it's not about, it's not about some bait and switch, sort of like, if you give, if you give then, then God will give back to you. You know, if you, if you, if you, if you, or if you, if you, if you give, God will bless you financially. You know, or, or if you give, God will bless the pastor financially. It's, it's not about that. That's not what we're talking about. But wise, manage, wise managers, good stewards, are entrusted with, with more resources to manage. That's, that's the wisdom of God. Getting more when you are wise enough to be generous with what you got <laughs> is the normal way that God works out his economy in the life of the Christian. Third big idea, or fourth big idea is this. There is wisdom in generosity. In other words, uh, the, 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 it makes sense. You, you go out into the world and, and what you're taught all the time just through life in general, you know, nobody means to do you harm, but, but you go out and, and the general perspective in the world would be this. It's foolish to follow Christ. There's no benefit in doing that. And what I compel you to believe in my sermons over the course of a year is, no, it's not foolish to, to, to follow Christ. Uh, it's wrong to say there's no, but there's great benefit in following Christ. And then out in the world, the, the message that you're, you're taught all time and time again is that there's no benefit in generosity. Because if you give it away, you may yourself run out. But, but the wisdom of the Bible says, no, there is great wisdom. It's a solid way to live your life, being a generous person. Proverbs 11 says that a generous man or woman will prosper. It goes on and it says this, he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And we were goofing around uh, Friday night. We were playing as a family around the table. Uh, six of the seven. Seven of us were around the table. Only, only six of us were willing to play. We were playing Monopoly. We were playing Monopoly. And you know it's that game where you like just want to uh, you want to cheat and lose because like it just takes too long. Like you don't want to cheat and win. You actually want to cheat and lose so the game can be done so everybody can go to, go to bed. But we were actually having a wonderful time that night and we probably played for, I don't know, two and a half hours of, of uh, Monopoly. If you've not played Monopoly before, it's like a life game and you actually have money, fake money, but you have money and you buy and sell. And, and I was just joking around. I was, I was, it was you know, the night before the night that, that uh, Alyssa would be leaving. And so I was pretty low-key decompressing. And I kept giving money away. And I was giving him money. Why do you keep giving money away, Dad? And I'd be like, because a generous man will prosper. I said, he, he, who, he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And I tell you what, giving away fake money is easy. <laughs> but, but can we really test God? and find truthfulness in this biblical ethic that with, with the stuff that we really have that really counts if we are generous we will prosper if we refresh others we will somehow in God's economy, it may not be tomorrow, it may be next year, it may be 10 years from now, it will certainly be in the kingdom of God for eternity, but it will happen. You yourself will be refreshed. That is the economy of God. That is the kingdom of God. In contrast, greed makes no sense at all. Greed makes no sense at all. In fact, the Bible says that some of us as Christians in the church 
Some of us, some of us wander away from God because of our greed. There's a riveting story in the Bible about that. But I'm going to save it for next week because I've run out of time. So, a summary of, 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 of Psalm 1. Come back next week. I want to tell you this story. It's riveting. Someone who, because of his greed, wandered away. Um, here's my heart's desire that we would be like trees planted along the riverbank. This is a summary of Psalm 1, what we're going to be memorizing together. That we would bear fruit in each season and that our leaves would never wither. And that we would prosper in all that we do. Back in the 70s, um, on Sunday mornings, um, my, my dad would wander into the family room with his, with his boots in hand and his uh, boot polishing kit in the other hand. And he would, he would sit down in, in, the, uh, in the family room and he would, he would take his time. There was no hurry. It was Sunday morning. He was a hard working man, but it was Sunday morning. He would take his time and he would polish his boots while we, while we, while we watched religious programming on TV. And back then, uh, we, had, we had three channels to choose from, and that was it. And so we'd watch a little bit of religious TV, and in no hurry, and we would eventually get into his sedan, and we would drive to church. And then he would, we would sit in the car a little bit longer than, than seemed uh, necessary. We'd sit in the parking lot, because again, my dad was in no hurry, my, uh, and he would make out his, his check. Uh, and, and, and he was in a particularly good mood, my father was. And he would make out his check and he would give generously. Um, he would give what the church calls tithe. He would give 10% or more of his income to the church. And you know, he did that for 50, 60 years. And I learned at an early age that my dad found deep joy in giving to the church. Deep joy in being a generous man. Not just toward the church because when you're generous, you're generous. Like across the board. He was consistently generous in how he cared for us kids. And, and consistently generous in how he gave us what we need, yes, but often gave us good things that we didn't necessarily need, but we wanted. And he found great pleasure in scratching that itch. Giving us things that would bring smiles to our faces. And I would like to think that some of that, some of that rubbed off on me. But what's important What's more important for us to realize today as we, as we finish this out is that your Father in heaven is like that. He's extravagantly generous. He is he's thrilled to give you not just the bare bones minimum of what you need. He is, he is, the, he is the provider, the giver of every good thing. And he invites us this morning to trust him and to step out as his children and to reflect his generous heart in our, in our own lives. In fact, nothing, nothing would make daddy happier. Let's pray.